from the Mercy One Studio. Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulus every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy One studio. Heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM. I am Joe Stopulis, and today I am joined by Dr. Leroy Husingay. And we are going to discuss the last of the great men of the Old Testament in the Bible. So after this, we're moving into uh, all the New Testament figures, but we have, to, we have to hit the Maccabean Revolt, which we'll do today. Let's start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the Maccabean Revolt, um, we are going to be covering the, basically, this is about 160 um, B.C., and then all the way into uh, the birth of Jesus. And there's a few other books that we'll mention that are written around the same time, obviously first and then second Maccabees, and they're parallel books. Uh, Maccabees gets into a little more theology and has some extra stories in it, but they're concurrent uh, time-wise. And then the Wisdom of Solomon, so the Book of Wisdom, and then the Book of Sirach as well are all written around this this time, these last this Maccabean revolt period until we get to uh, the birth of Jesus. I remember going through the Jeff Cavins Bible study for the first time and learning about the Mac- Maccabean Revolt and the stories of the, the heroism of Judas Maccabeus. Uh, really incredible stuff here. When you talk about being persecuted for your faith and standing up for it, uh, some of the greatest examples of that are found in these two great books of uh, First and Second. Maccabees. So really excited on the other side of this break to have Dr. Leroy Huzinga with us to to really explore the Maccabean Revolt, explore first and second Maccabees and, and figure out what lessons their lives can teach us living as men in, in 2019. So we're going to head to a short break and we will be right back. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Support for programming of Catholic Women Now partially provided by Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte. Cindy Schulte on the web at cindyschulte.com, 515-226-2111. Cindy and her team know health insurance. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr Wednesday mornings at 10 and online at iowacatholicradio.com or on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. r and Realty is showing Jesus Christ at work through comical and informative programs like The Uncommon Good on Iowa Catholic Radio. The Catholic Tuition Organization provides tuition assistance to qualified families so they can send their kids to our Catholic schools. Great tax benefits for donors and great education for our kids. Online. C-T-O-Iowa.org. Thank you, Confluence Brewing Company, for underwriting Christ is the Answer with Father Ricardo and for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Father Ricardo is featured daily at 11 a.m. Monday through Friday. Confluence Brewing Company is located off the bike trail south of Grays Lake. Confluencebrewing.com. My Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis, and today I am joined by Dr. Leroy Husingay. He is the Administrative Chair of Human and Divine Sciences and Associate Professor of Theology at the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota. He's the author of the New Testament Isaac, Tradition and Intertextuality in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, he is also, very, this is very important, is a referral to the show from the great Dr. Bud Marr. Very important. Dr. Husingay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So you and Dr. Bud Marr go back to your days at Duke Divinity School then? Uh, yes, we do, early part of the millennium. Does that mean that you're a convert as well or no? Sort of. Um, to make a long story short, I was baptized as an infant. Uh, my mom got in a fight with a nun when I was like five or six, <laughs> so I got raised Lutheran. Uh, then kept running into good Catholics through the years, and finally uh, Easter Vigil 
2011 wow. was reconciled. So I'm a functional convert. Oh legally, man, I've always been <laughs> juridically, I've always been Catholic. You never want to get in a fight with a nun. That's not a good no. start. Not a good start to the story. Uh, no. Well, thanks for joining us. You know, I shot you an email, and you know, as I'm setting up these 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 episodes, I really want to make sure that the the speaker, the person I'm interviewing, I you, uh, has something that they're interested in, and you had chosen Judas Maccabeus. Can you walk me through yeah. why is that? He why is he someone that you're interested in? Well, because he's not in the Protestant Bible, but he's in the Catholic Bible, um, and of course, beyond that, the the story of the Maccabees is simply incredible. Uh, you have a tiny little uh, ethnic nation taking on one of the great powers of the world uh, in what's effectively guerrilla warfare and uh, turning them back. So the, the story is simply dramatic, and it's really, it's really a shame that it's not in Protestant Bibles because that means a lot of people you know, in the West don't know it as well as they should. When people say the Bible is boring, they're clearly not reading it. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah. especially I mean, stories like this, to your point, I, I love the story of Maccabees in, for a lot of different reasons. We'll get into them. But to your point, this, the heroism of, that we're going to we're gonna talk about today, but uh, just having that bold faith that you see lived out in these, in these stories is agreed. I'm, I, I love the story. So we'll jump into it. I, I really do think... Uh, as I've mentioned with a handful of them, especially with Ezra and Nehemiah, but specifically with this one as well, the historical context is so important for us to understand why this is even ha- happening. Why do they need to do what they're doing? Can you kind of give us a, maybe the the rough historical con- uh, landscape of what they're experiencing and how we're getting into the, the books of Maccabees? Uh, certainly. So we go back to Alexander the Great, actually. Um, and in... 332, Alexander the Great and all his campaigns uh, takes over Egypt and Judea, uh, Judah, not yet Roman, was part of Egypt, administrated by the Egyptians, and so Judea, where all the Jews are, becomes uh, Greek in 332 B.C. Um, Unfortunately for Alexander, he dies uh, about a decade later, 323, of malaria, and his generals then divide up his kingdom, which is basically the eastern Mediterranean, uh, deep into Arabia, India, uh, you know, even what might be today part of China. It's an area just shy of the size of the contiguous United States. Um, so as four generals divide that up, for biblical history, the two you, we need to know are Antiochus, and Ptolemy, um, excuse me, Seleucus and Ptolemy. Seleucus ends up founding uh, what becomes the Syrian kingdom in Antioch, right, just north of the Holy Land, and Ptolemy founds an Egyptian kingdom. And so like later, Cleopatra, the famous Cleopatra, is a Ptolemaic uh, princess uh, centuries down the line. And you have then uh, Judah, Judea, Right, Jerusalem, right between uh, these two kingdoms. And it's never good to be a small uh, ethnic enclave caught between two superpowers. It's a little bit like the Poles, you know, in the 1930s and 40s between Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia. And so the Jews are being ruled by the Ptolemies uh, for a while. Uh, but in 198, the Seleucids defeat Egypt and end up taking over uh, what we call Judea, Judah, the, the area of the Jews around Jerusalem. Um, and then, in the year 175, a Syrian Seleucid king named Antiochus IV takes over. And he wants to consolidate his rule over his kingdom. Uh, he takes bribes for the high priesthood in Jerusalem. Some, you have to some, pay him a some, lot some of very, money. If you very want to be serious, high very serious bribes. Some very, yeah, I, so uh, you had two high priests <laughs> going back and forth, outbidding each other, one named Jason, one named Menelaus, right? And I mean, Jason and Menelaus don't sound like Greek na- or uh, Jewish names, yeah. right? They're Greek, which shows you that the Jewish leadership had accommodated itself to Greek culture, Hellenistic culture. And that's a big problem in this period. Um, 
you know, a good portion of the Jews want to live like Greeks, live like pagans. You know, First Maccabees talks about this quite a bit. Um, you know, so they can get on with the nations of the world. And, you know, Israel in the Old Testament is called to be separate from the world precisely so they can actually be a light to the world, right? Instead of accommodating to the world's darkness, they're supposed to be the proverbial candle. And that's not going on right now. So, well, uh, as I say, go ahead. This is this leads us right now. We are you kind of give us a history. Now we are into the book of of First Maccabees. One just historical note again as as we're looking at the Bible as a whole, uh, Maccabees is, is the final of the narrative books going into uh, the New Testament. As you, people may have figured out by the fact that now we're talking about 100 BC, uh, this is the book that then leads us into. Uh, the New Testament. So again, we have now entered into the book of Maccabees, uh, and as, as you're kind of laying the groundwork here, the, uh, history repeats itself. The worship and the knowledge of the of of what the Jewish people are supposed to be doing seems to be getting lost, and they seem to be looking and feeling and smelling a lot more like the culture. Exactly. Exactly. And so on, yeah. onto the scene then. In uh, I'm trying to think, we are in first into second Maccabees is really where you've kind of set the scene for this is not things are not going well. They're they're going to the gyms. Uh, they're with this, which is means they're just really getting into the the culture at the time. Uh, they're they look they're trying to hide their circumcisions. All these types of things are going on, and they're losing their Jewish identity. Right, right, and so this Antiochus fellow, Antiochus the fourth, um, his his. Uh, desired surname is Epiphanes, which means God made manifest. You know, sounds like the Christian season of Epiphany. Mm-hmm. And his uh, enemies nicknamed him Epimenes. Little play on words, Epiphanes, Epimenes, because Epimenes means the insane. You hear like the word manic in Epimenes, right? Um, well, he's aggressive, he's assertive, and he wants to make war on Egypt. So in 168, he goes to Alexandria, takes his army about 20,000 strong down there and gets ready to lay siege to Alexandria, you know, one of the great cities of the ancient world. Um, And the Romans by this time have risen as a major power in the Mediterranean, having defeated Carthage uh, twice by this time. Um, And they send a team of diplomats. They don't bother sending legions yet. They send some diplomats, you know, togas and wingtips, that sort of thing. And Antiochus is dealing with a guy named Gaius Papilius Linus, and uh, we'll just call him Gaius for short. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, they negotiate over a couple of weeks, and finally Gaius humiliates him, uh, draws a circle in the sand around Antiochus, Antiochus's feet, and tells him, look, you're not going to you know, step outside that circle until you've decided whether you're going to invade Alexandria or not. And by the way, you're not going to invade you know, not going to lay siege to Alexandria, or we're going to send about 300,000 legionaries at you. And so uh, Antiochus is humiliated. He realizes that if he dares take on Rome, he'll just be roadkill. It's that simple. So he turns his army around. Now, he was annoyed with the Jews already, and armies in the ancient world, the Roman legions being an exception, but most armies in the ancient world, like Antiochus's army, weren't paid very much. They're given enough to eat and live on. They made their money by sacking the cities they laid siege to. So they'd be given a few days to go plunder, steal what they could, capture people to take and sell as slaves. And so he's got this army now that didn't get to sack Alexandria and wondering what they made the trip for, and they're probably feeling mutinous. Well, what's on the way back to Antioch? The city of Jerusalem. So Antiochus offers his troops basically the city of Jerusalem as a consolation prize, and uh, he's already tired of the Jews anyway, so he ends up um, making war in Judea and on Jerusalem, and he even forbids the practice of Judaism. Uh, not even so much saying, well, you've got to worship the pagan gods too, but if you do anything Jewish, you get the death penalty. And First Maccabees chapter 1 describes this in horrific death, uh, detail. Um, you have a copy of the Torah, death penalty. Uh, keep the Sabbath, death penalty. Circumcise your children, death penalty. There's a horrific description in there about how Jewish women were crucified with their infants hanging from their necks and that sort of thing. Uh, finally, if that wasn't bad enough, in the winter of 167 B.C., 
uh, Antiochus's troops enter the Jewish temple and they sacrifice a sow, a female pig, on the high mm. altar. Uh, this is what becomes known as the abomination of desolation. And this precedes then what we know as the uh, Maccabean revolt. Yeah, so um, as I was gonna say, now, now we're getting into Maccabe, First Maccabees 2, and it, so it's, you've set the stage well that it's, things are not going well, the new powers coming in are, are A, making it illegal to even practice your faith, and we're going to see how they test it. And there's a lot of parallels you can see from today's world trying to be authentically Catholic, and we'll get to some of those at the end, but um, mm-hmm. you, you can see that they're up against it. They've got a lot going against them. Well, it says here in chapter 2, Mattathias Mattath- and his sons, uh, he's got five sons, um, and they are they are devout, and they're going to hold up the law. So let's this show goes very fast. So let's walk through quickly uh, uh, as, as much as you can. How now? Sure. Judas Maccabeus has arrived on the scene, and what is he going to do? Yeah. So there's a village northwest of Jerusalem, a little distance called Modiin, and the pagan officials, Antiochus's officials, come to the village, and they're going to get all the Jews to offer sacrifice. Um, Right to pagan gods, to the image of the emperor, and you know, thus show that they're no longer Jews but good pagans. You know, neither Jews nor Christians can do that. It's idolatry. Um, and so there's a standoff, and one hapless, nameless Jew walks up to try and break the stalemate by actually just offering the sacrifice. And uh, Mattathias runs him through with the zeal of Phineas and uh, says, "All you who are." you know, loyal to the law and the covenant with the fathers, come out with me. And so the rebels take to the hills, a few thousand of them at first, and in one battle, these few thousand defeat 100,000 Syrians, and another, a couple hundred thousand Syrians, historians figure, because it's asymmetrical warfare, right? You know, the the Antiochenes, the Syrians are uh, a conventional army for that time, and the Jews are fighting uh, with guerrilla tactics. Uh, so after three years, uh, finally, in 164, Judas, uh, son of Mattathias, uh, nicknamed Maccabeus the Hammer, right, like Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, uh, Judas takes the temple area and rededicates the temple, and people can read about that in First Maccabees 4. This gives us uh, what the Jews call Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights, right, celebrating the Maccabean defeat over the Syrians. And then that institutes, it's really fascinating, uh, about a hundred years of Jewish self-rule in a sort of uh, golden age that gets ended when the Roman general Pompey uh, will take Judah and Jerusalem uh, in 63 B.C. There's a great quote here, 1 Maccabees 3, uh, 18. It says, it is easy, Judas Maccabeus says, it is easy for many to be hemmed in by few, for in the sight of heaven there is no difference between saving by many or by few. It is not on the size of the army that the victory in battle depends, but strength comes from heaven. So, Well, and that's, that's a consistent theme in the Old mm-hmm. Testament, right? I mean, David and Goliath, it's one-on-one, but it's, you know, kind of a pipsqueak versus a giant. Um, you know, I think of Gideon and his 300, Gideon mm-hmm. and his 300 men, right? Um, Gideon's trumpet, you know, uh, David often outnumbered and on the run. The armies of Israel often outnumbered, you know, and they just trust in the Lord, because like, you know, Exodus 15 says, the Lord is a warrior. So there are two other major things I'd like to talk about in our next four minutes. One is the the prayers for the dead. So we as Catholics talk about, we, we pray for our dead. That comes from the book of Maccabees. Yeah. Um, you know, it's important also that, you know, like Pope Benedict has said, you know, not every Catholic practice is or needs to be rooted in the Bible, but, you know, prayers for the dead are a pretty common thing in uh, Jewish religion, you know, and the earliest Christians, you know, Christianity is a Jewish phenomenon through and through. Jesus was Jewish. It's not half pagan, half Jewish. I mean, it's Jewish in worldview, mindset, outlook. You know, the earliest Christians, you know, being fundamentally Jews that believe in Jesus, you know, are pagans who converted to this Jewish sect called Christianity. Yeah, they're going to pray to the dead, too, because Jews were doing it, and it's not simply like one random thing in First Maccabees. It's like this was a common Jewish practice. Yeah. But, it, you know, I just think it's interesting as we, anytime we're questioned on that, I'm like, well, it's, it's right here. It's in First Maccabees. Uh, moving on to Second Maccabees, these books have some overlap, right, from a, from a timing perspective. So maybe the first seven chapters or so 
and second Maccabees, correct me if I'm wrong, there's some overlap time-wise. Um, but yeah, and you know, it's not in our Bibles, but there's even the books of third and fourth Maccabee, Maccabees, which you'll sometimes uh, find in uh, Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox hmm. uh, Bibles. Well, uh, anyway, yeah, there is a lot of re- uh, rewriting of what's already happened in um, first Maccabees, uh, Second Maccabees claims to be summarizing a five-volume work by a historian named Jason of Cyrene. Uh, the most famous passage in Second Maccabees is a little bit novelistic, right? First Maccabees is more history, and Second Maccabees is like novelistic history, like a good historical novel. And the most famous story in there is the martyrdom of the mother and her seven sons exactly, in yeah. Second Maccabees seven. Yep. And I think this is, if you want to learn, just if you want to read a little piece of Maccabees, this is, I would recommend, obviously, those first three or four chapters, maybe first five, six, seven chapters of First Maccabees, and then this Second Maccabees 7, uh, The Martyrdom of the Seven Brothers. And it's just a really great story of having that trust in the Lord and, and go, you know, the, the power of martyrdom. And It's one of the most important passages in the entire Bible um, for a couple reasons. One it's got resurrection as a correlate of creation, mm. right? There's repeated refrains in there about how God created us and gave us these bodies, and so you can kill us, but he'll give us our bodies back at the end of time. Uh, so that's really important. The second reason it's so important is that it's the paradigm, really, for early Christian martyrdom. Um, you know, it's a typical martyr story like you'll find in later Christian martyrologies, where, you know, you have to prefer death to sin. You know, it is better to die than commit an intrinsic evil, right? And here, of course, you know, the question's idolatry, you know, which is big time. But still, you know, the, Jew- the Jewish Christian Catholic principle is it's better to die than sin. Um, and so, yeah, they give up their lives for the Lord. Um, and again, you know, that's the challenge to us today, too. It's like, you know, part of the problem with modern Christianity, Catholic or otherwise, in, you know, Europe and the West, uh, America, South America, is the temptation to accommodate, right? To accommodate to the spirit of the age, uh, to do what others are doing, to recast our faith in the world's terms, and that's low-grade idolatry. That is not a good thing. You know, so instead of doing that, it's better to be who we are, and if it costs us jobs, if it costs us position, you know, God forbid, if it costs us our lives, well, that's what we're called to. Christianity is a martyr faith. You know, I, I think it's a great way to end this episode. When I first had been introduced probably 10 years ago to the book of Maccabees, I just remember being so fired up over it, over for my faith, uh, for helping just to add this, to make me excited about defending the faith. And I think, uh, to, to your point, it's a shame that more people don't know about these great stories uh, in our history because they're such a good example for us today, living as Catholics in, in America of all places. Um, but all around the world, Catholics are persecuted. Catholics are need to stand up and to be uh, leaders in faith. And I think the Book of Maccabees and the Man of Judas Maccabeus shows us that. So, uh, Dr. Huzenge, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. We're going to head to a short break. Stick around, and we'll be right back. Fifty years ago, tuition and costs at Catholic elementary schools were mostly absorbed by parishes. Now, higher salaries for lay teachers and new technologies have greatly increased the cost for families. Hi, I'm Jean Wells at the Catholic Tuition Organization, and my job is to reduce tuition costs for families and award great tax credits to generous donors. Want to help? Please donate today at ctoiowa.org. Let's do this for the kids and their future. Thank you for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Hi, this is Father Fabian Moncada. Would you consider a $30 a month donation? Your support keeps Iowa Catholic Radio on the air connecting people to Christ. Join Iowa Catholic Radio for the Carathon Monday, August 26th. Hi, this is Joe Stopulus. Thank you to construction professionals for underwriting Man Up. Monday mornings at 9 on Iowa Catholic Radio. Construction professionals, a Catholic family business built on a strong foundation. cpcustomhomes.com my help comes from you. You're right here, pulling me through. You carry and welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We have come to the end 
of the Old Testament, and I, I'll just be remiss, I mentioned this earlier, um, one of the other books that's written around this time is the book of Shirak, and I love the book of Shirak. The entire chapter of Shirak 2 is worth sitting down and reading over and over again. I, I, I do think that this will be a reading at my funeral. I'll just put it on there and let it go. Uh, it, the whole thing. the whole. So I'm going to read you at least part of it right now. This is Sirach 2. I think it goes very well with what we're talking about with Maccabees, about understanding that living the Christian life is not going to be easy and we will have times of persecution. And I think Sirach does a great job of that. So this is the beginning of Sirach 2. My son, if you come forward to serve the Lord, remain in justice and in fear and prepare yourself for temptation. Set your heart right and be steadfast. Incline your ear and receive words of understanding, and not, do not be hasty in times of calamity. Await God's patience, cling to him, and do not depart, that you may be wise in all your ways. Accept whatever is brought up upon you, and endure in it in sorrow. In changes that humble you, be patient. For gold and silver are tested in fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. Trust in God, and he will help you. Hope in him, and he will make way make your way straight. Stay in fear of him and grow old in him. You who fear the Lord, wait for his mercy. Do not turn aside lest you fall. And then it continues to go on from there, and that's about half that's about half of it. If you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for many trials. Prepare yourself for hardship. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to serve Jesus in this life, you are going to have trials, not if, but when. And it says it right there. For as gold and, fire are tested, as gold and silver are tested in fire, so are acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. When you come upon these trials, when you come upon difficulties in, in, in acting in a Christian manner, whether it be at work or with friends, understand that these, these trials are what are helping you to grow. Uh, these, are, these are trials. James, the book of James, talks so much about how we need to see these as opportunities for growth when we have persecutions, when we have hard times. So I recommend pull out your Bible, read all through Sirach. Do you read the whole book of Sirach? I mean, the book of Sirach is great. The, the wisdom in it is phenomenal. But the, this is the chapter of Sirach 2, Sirach 1, 2, and 3 are just so great. And I, just, I come back to them so often, I can't encourage you to do that uh, enough. Well, we are now moving into the New Testament. So uh, I felt really great. Thanks to all my guests who, who have joined us for the show. I know I learned a lot. I hope you guys did too about a lot of these great figures from the Old Testament. Uh, and when we return, we will be jumping into uh, the life of John the Baptist, who is the, the, the last of the Old Testament prophets. He's the last prophet before Jesus uh, to, to prepare the way for us and prepare the way for the Savior. So my thanks again to you for joining us on Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis. It's time to man up. Man Up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulis. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.